let me invoke the spirit of hockey. <laughs> now, I know it's a sensitive subject. <laughs> I know that I should not be doing that in Montreal. <laughs> and I know that the final was not probably a good memory, but I would uh, urge you to actually focus on the future. With an unprecedented 24 championship wins, how could it not be the case that you will be back? Yeah. So in hockey, there are three periods. And I would like to touch upon three themes very briefly. And I promise not to go in over time, <laughs> because otherwise I might end up in a penalty shootout with John, who is probably very keen to actually play that game. Now, first of all, I'd like to give you a very brief overview of the global economy as we see it from the IMF perspective. Then I would like to do a quick tour on the table of some key players. And third, I would like to offer a few thoughts about how we can lay the foundations of the next era of growth. How to drive the puck into the goal. OK, very quickly, from the top row of the rink, if you will, what do we see? Well, we see a recovery that is improving. From 3% growth last year, we'll probably be at 3.6% this year, and 3.9% next year. Advanced economies are finally strengthening at different rhythms, but we forecast about 2.3% growth for them this year. Emerging market and developing economies will continue to provide the bulk of global growth at a slower pace than they have so far, and it's probably OK. I know there is a lot of trepidation, but I'll come to that in, the, in, in my second part. We plan on growth being at about 5% for these categories of countries and 5.4% next year. Very quickly, what are the three major risks that we see on the horizon? The first one out of the advanced economies is clearly that of what we have coined lowflation. Horrible word, pour ceux d'entre vous qui aimez vraiment la langue anglaise. Lowflation, that is durable, low inflation, if not deflation. You've heard, I'm sure, a lot about that from Larry in the last uh, few hours. Clearly, the recent stance by the ECB is welcome, whether it's the actual use of instruments or the use of words is coming at the right time. And we're encouraged to see that it is actually willing to do more if necessary. Deuxième risque à l'horizon, c'est celui qui vient des marchés émergents et que subiraient probablement les marchés émergents, c'est-à-dire une volatilité financière accrue qui serait notamment la résultante de la normalisation de la politique monétaire aux États-Unis. Good communication to that end will be extremely welcome, and good communication among central bankers. It doesn't have to be on the front page of the Financial Times or The Economist every week, but communication will be key. It will not be sufficient. And clearly, those emerging market, and emerging market economies and developing markets will also have to really work on their fundamentals in order to be able to resist potential external volatility, which will increase compared with what we've had. Le troisième risque, eh c'est celui auquel vous pensez tous, c'est le risque géopolitique qui peut survenir de n'importe quel coin de la planète actuellement. Et donc, clairement, l'épiphénomène se trouve plutôt en Europe centrale, Europe de l'Est, avec les questions relatives à la situation de l'Ukraine et de ses voisins. L'élection présidentielle qui vient d'avoir lieu est évidemment euh, un moment qu'il faut saisir pour essayer d'éviter que ce risque géopolitique ne se matérialise. Ce n'est pas le seul. There are other geopolitical risks on the horizons as well, and I leave you to think about them, but you have them on your mind, I'm sure. Ce qui ne veut pas dire qu'on ait réglé tous les vieux problèmes. Un certain nombre d'entre eux subsistent et on doit continuer à essayer de les résoudre. Problème du chômage, en particulier celui des jeunes. Le haut niveau de dette d'un certain nombre de pays. La nécessité de finir et de poursuivre la réforme financière. I would like to thank you, Monsieur le Recteur, to have mentioned that. It is something that I, have, that I hold very strongly, the fact that the financial reform has to be pursued. We were in London not so long ago with Mark Carney, 
and we did both focus on this. It's all very well to have the capital ratios. It's all very well to have the liquidity ratios. And I thank Jean-Claude for the persistence with which he has actually insisted on that taking place, irrespective of the fuss that we heard from many. But more needs to be done in terms of culture and how the financial world understands that it is not in and of itself a bubble that can operate on its own, but how it has to serve the economy, how it has to be successful by being sensible, and how it should actually focus on its mission and not s'égarer dans des terrains inconnus et dangereux. Final one that needs to be tackled as well, the list of structural reforms is not endless, but it's common to many of those economies, whether it's the opening up of some very restricted territories, the simplification of the way of doing business. And Monsieur le Premier Ministre, c'est un bonheur de vous entendre dire que le Québec est ouvert pour le business et que vous allez réduire et simplifier les modalités d'action des entrepreneurs. C'est cela, évidemment, qui est indispensable. So, bottom line for this first half, the recovery is turning the corner on the Great Recession. But the recovery remains fragile, uneven, and faces the twin enemies of complacency and fatigue. Thank goodness somebody invented the word fatigue in English. Huh? <laughs> they probably borrowed it from somebody. <laughs> now, so as I said, this is the view from the top of the arena. Let's zoom in and get some statistics on some of the key players. I'll be brief. United States, which is your major trading partner, its growth has lost some momentum in the early part of 2014. We think that it's coming back. Some of that slowdown is attributable, according to them, to this very harsh winter. I think you would call it the spring. But uh, <laughs> I think we can expect a rebound of the US economy, and certainly there are signs to that effect. Uh, and we expect growth to exceed potential over the next few quarters, driven by a robust uh, private demand. In terms of challenges, there are two areas that need to be watched. Number one, the gradual, well-communicated withdrawal of the uh, monetary uh, policy support by the Fed. And second, clearly the indication sooner rather than later of the long, well, medium and long-term uh, fiscal plan that needs to be agreed, and that's a political agreement which is obviously challenging in that country at the moment. Japan, underlying momentum is strengthening. Uh, clear consumption number that came out today were extremely positive, but it's not it. There is more coming up, and we certainly hope that the third arrow of the Abenomics, three arrow policies, uh, will not turn into a whole series of acupun acupuncture needle points, but in a true uh, third arrow, which will sustain growth going forward. Euro area, which is also emerging from recession, although well, growth is certainly stronger in the core than in the south. It has come a long way. It has gone through profound changes of its economic architecture. And it is critical in our view that it be continued, that it be continued with courage, and that structural reforms be considered and implemented and delivered upon by members of the euro area. What about the emerging market economies? Well, they've been a huge pillar to support global growth going forward. Emerging Asia, in particular, remains a bright spot, pushing ahead with the world's highest growth rate at around 6.7% in 2014-2015. A key driver of this breakaway performance is China, which is forecast to grow at a slow pace, granted, and I don't think, we don't think, that they should be a lot to worry about. It's not because it's moving gradually from the double digits where it was about six years ago to gradually you know, 7.8, 7.5, possibly 7 next year. It's only a factor of the huge development that that economy has experienced, which should inev inevitably lead to slower gro growth rates going forward. Another region that continues to be on the rise is Sub-Saharan Africa, from which I have just returned. Many African countries have managed to weather the crisis quite well and sustain an expansion of around 5% per year on average, with some a lot higher than those 5%. It's the second highest 
growth area in the world after East Asia, second highest growth area. It has an untapped potential, both natural and human. The forecast is for this growth to continue. But as we said at the conference that just took place in Maputo in Mozambique, if Africa is rising, and you've heard that many times, Africa is also watching. And there's a lot to be said about how they're going to master the development of natural resources and make sure that that expansion that is taking place at the moment is actually inclusive and that those untapped resources are used to the benefit of the population and not to the benefit of a few. Some countries are taking the risk of accumulating debt. They need to be cautious. They have an erosion of fiscal space as well because they've used quite a bit of that during the crisis. And they need to be cautious as well. Latin America now, turning a very modest acceleration in activity. It's expected to remain in lower gear, rising from 2.5% in 2014 to 3% in 2015. Now, they're different pace, different situation. And if clearly Mexico is expected to benefit from stronger US growth and from the massive reforms that it has undertaken, provided that it pursues that at the softer legislation level, a country like Brazil, where low confidence seems likely to hold back investment and activity, will not see unless a miracle happens, particularly because of the World Cup a very, very high growth level coming up. Finally, and that's a region that I'm also just coming back from, uh, the Middle East, which is another region that is full of potential but suffering massively at the moment and which will need the attention of the world, both from a financial and economic standpoint but also from a geopolitical standpoint if it wants to build a better future for its population, including very large numbers of refugees that are really weighing on the economies of countries like Lebanon and uh, Jordan. So where does our hockey game stand now? I've talked about the view from the top of the arena, and we've analyzed some of the moves of the key players, which brings me to my third topic, which is the foundation of the next era of growth and the key elements of the strategy for driving the puck into the goal. Now, clearly, the major challenge for all countries, including Canada, is to make, as I said, growth stronger and more inclusive. I've used, in Africa, the concept of turning oil growth into green growth. I've heard you, Mr. Prime Minister, talk about the blue growth, which is clearly a very important concept as well. But I certainly hope that blue is green and green is blue and all of it comes together. But those are complicated questions, and I certainly would not pretend that there is a one-size-fits-all. And while there are countries where it is probably very helpful for the public investment to draw the benefit of the very low cost of financing to invest in needed infrastructure, it is not going to be a recipe for all, and it's not going to work for all fundamentals of all economies around the planet. Many are trying to rebalance the economy towards more stable sources of growth. We're seeing it in China, which has gradually moved from being largely export-driven to being now much more investment-driven, and which may have to move from that yet again to being also consumption-driven and to have a more balanced system. A country like Germany is also trying to shift from being heavily export-led to being more consumption-driven, and it is very gradually uh, happening. Canada is also rebalancing its economy from consumption and housing towards exports and business investment as key drivers of growth. Last year, for the first time since 2001, the contribution of net exports to overall growth turned positive, but the performance of non-energy exports and investments remains too weak. So looking forward, we expect in this country growth to pick up to about 2.25% in 2014 with the continued recovery in the US, boosting Canada's exports and business investment. Policies should sustain the acceleration of activity, 
monetary policy supporting demand until the recovery is cemented, and fiscal policy striking the right balance between propping up growth and rebuilding fiscal space. I know there is this forever debate that is often activated by those who like controversies as to is austerity compatible with growth? Well, we take the view that it is and that they're not mutually exclusive and that it's going to be a matter of striking the right balance and the right pace. Moreover, Canada's rebalancing is taking place along the transformation of the North American energy sector. Je vous écoutais, Monsieur le Ministre, évoquer l'ensemble des ressources énergétiques dont dispose la province. Le Canada, lui-même, dispose de ressources incroyables. Et il n'y a aucun doute que ce secteur de l'énergie constituera une base importante de croissance pour le Canada. These prospects need to be unleashed. But how? Well, we at the IMF see two priorities. And I'll mention those two briefly before I conclude. First of all, an expansion in transport infrastructure that would allow Canada to tap into favorable growth dynamics in regions beyond North America, especially in Asia, but also in Europe. Good decisions have been announced last week that would clearly open up the road for more going towards Europe. A more open regime for inward foreign direct investment could help in easing infrastructure constraints. By both, by some of the IMF estimates, full market access to Canada's energy products could raise GDP by about 2% over a 10 years horizon. Now, of course, that needs to happen with due respect to the environment, and it cannot be to the detriment of the environment. Now, am I going to reinvent myself in an expert in environment matters? No. It's tempting, though, but no. I've done enough reinvention so far. But what we have done at the IMF, and I strongly encouraged the teams to do that, is actually look at the value, the costing of externalities. Because a lot of factors about the economy are determined by the very simple rule of the right price. Free markets, yes, but the right price. And what is factored into setting the right price? And externalities are matters that need to be taken into account for setting the right price. Whether it's the use of fossil fuels, whether it's wastewater, whether it's carbon emissions, whether it's air pollution, with the increase in risks on many aspects, whether it's the broader side effects like vehicle use, like congested roads, like additional deaths, and so on and so forth. Economists are very good at listing the direct, indirect collateral consequences, but those have to be factored in. Those are the externalities that need to actually determine the price. So with all that, what I'm trying to tell you is that whether it's done at the provincial level, whether it's done at the national level, we don't need to wait until the UNCCC or other mechanism has actually agreed on the objective of how we're going to replace Kyoto to actually define what is appropriate for the coming generations in our respective corners. And that's what we're trying to show with a book that will soon be published about the right setting of prices. We're not advocate, we're not propagating other causes, we're focusing on our mission, but I regard that this is part of our mission. The second priority is that growth in the energy sector must be made inclusive. Its contribution to the economy broadened and its benefit more widely shared. Stronger linkages between the energy sector and the broader economy can certainly help. Removing barriers to internal labor mo mobility and trade are important elements of that strategy, both to bring people with important skills to the areas where the jobs are and to bring more jobs to people that are not living in the resource-rich area. Productivity could also get a boost from these measures. And that clearly has to benefit the entire region. After all, it was among other things, because clearly some of the Middle East countries helped a lot, but it was among other things the expansion in North American oil production that helped keep the price of oil stable over the past three years 
despite major geopolitical disruptions that have taken place, whether you look at Libya or at other places, uh, including further south. So I've only focused on those two components. But I believe that it should be part and parcel of the strategy for growth that certainly Canada will be looking at, including beyond the borders of La Belle Province. Everybody is changing. Everybody is relooking at the way of doing business. And growth will probably follow different recipes from those that it has followed in the past. We at the IMF are changing as well. There are 188 members at the IMF. And uh, whether it's our surveillance activity, whether it's our capacity building, whether it's our lending activities, we also try to reinvent ourselves. And I would very much hope that whether it's in the Far East of Asia, in Africa, or in the advanced economies, the IMF is not seen as le FMI de bon papa, but un FMI moderne, un FMI qui est capable de s'adapter, un FMI qui est capable de répondre aux besoins d'un monde en mouvement, d'un monde dont l'équilibre monétaire international est en train de changer sous nos yeux. Nous continuons aussi, comme vous le faites avec talent, Monsieur Emilia, à constituer au sein de ces 188 membres un forum de discussion. Nous le faisons avec des partenaires. Je voudrais reconnaître Angèle Guria, mon ami de l'OCDE, avec lequel nous travaillons sur un certain nombre de projets et dont le leadership est extraordinaire sur des questions concernant notamment l'évasion fiscale et la disparition de la base fiscale taxable. Tout ça est important. Pourquoi Et je reviens à mes propos introductifs. Parce que, comme pour une équipe de hockey, on ne peut bien travailler qu'en équipe. Et ce forum que nous constituons, les relations que nous avons avec les partenaires internationaux, les autres institutions internationales, j'aurais pu mentionner également la Banque mondiale, permettent aux institutions de cette nature, dans un esprit d'équipe, de servir l'ensemble euh, des membres de nos institutions créées tout près d'ici, à Bretton Woods, dans le New Hampshire. Avant de finir, je voudrais rendre un dernier hommage qui m'est particulièrement cher, puisqu'il était né tout près d'ici. Il a beaucoup travaillé au sein du G20. Il a été un compagnon de route, ou plutôt j'ai été sa compagne de route, puisqu'il était un tout petit peu plus ancien que moi dans mes fonctions. Il a beaucoup travaillé en particulier jusqu'à ce dernier G20, pratiquement, où nous avons évoqué l'augmentation de deux points euh, du PIB mondial, à échéance de 10 ans. Il a été ce compagnon de route formidable qui a servi son pays avec talent, qu'il a fait jusqu'à la dernière heure. C'est la première fois que je reviens au Canada depuis 5 ans, sans que ne soit présent ni Marc Carnet, qui a décidé de vivre sa vie après avoir si bien servi la Banque centrale du Canada. C'est la première fois que je reviens et que Jim Flaherty n'est pas là. Lorsque vous allez m'applaudir dans quelques instants, je voudrais qu'on consacre un peu de ces applaudissements à Jim, qui était un ami. Merci.